worship with us. Let us bow our heads and pray. Our Father in heaven, we're grateful for life that you have given to us and that you, by your power, preserve. Father, as we bow in your presence, we ask you to bless us with the presence of your Spirit, that he may guide us into truth, that he may convict resisting hearts, and that the truth may triumph in every life. I humble myself in your presence, and I ask you today, God, to speak through me clearly and simply, that the truth may be received gladly. If there are those who are still on their way, bring them safely, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Our subject is innocent and condemned. Innocent and condemned. Go with me to John chapter 19. We shall begin reading at verse 5. John chapter 19, reading from verse 5. And I'll be reading from the King James Version. John 19, reading from verse 5. Innocent and condemned. How is that possible? The Bible says, Then came Jesus forth wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate said unto them, Behold the man. When the chief priests, therefore, and the Pharisees saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate saith unto them, Take ye him and crucify him. Why? For I find no fault in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and by our law he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. Jesus came forth wearing that crown of thorns, dressed in purple in an attempt to mock him. When the Jews, the chief priests, and the officers saw him, when they saw God, because Christ was God and he remains God, when they saw God in human form, they cried out saying, crucify him. Pilate, who was not a believer, he was a Roman, not a Jew. Pilate said, take ye him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. Innocent and condemned. There's something unbiblical about that. Because the Bible tells us that the innocent or the righteous should go free and the guilty should be condemned. Let's go to uh, Luke chapter 23. We shall begin reading at verse 39. Our subject is innocent and condemned. Luke 23, reading from verse 39. It's just one book to the left of John. And one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him saying, If thou be Christ... Save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation, and we indeed justly, for we receive the due rewards of our deeds. But this man hath done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee today, Thou shalt be with me, in paradise. Let us focus on the words of the thief. I usually refer to him as the thief on the right. Verse 40, but the other answering rebuked him saying, dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation and we indeed justly. For we receive the due rewards of our deeds. This is important language. But this man, verse 41, hath done what? Nothing amiss. Here again, we have someone declaring the innocence of Christ. Pilate said, I find no fault in him. None. Not I find one fault 
or I find too little faults. The testimony of Pilate is, I find no fault in him. The testimony of the thief on the cross was, this man hath done nothing amiss. Nothing. Now, we have two witnesses, Pilate and the thief on the cross. The Bible tells us in the mouth of two or three witnesses, any testimony shall stand. Did you get the significance of what I just said? We have two witnesses, and according to the Jewish system, a testimony held by two witnesses was valid. Jesus Christ, says Pilate, he found no fault. The thief on the cross, he had done nothing amiss. Now, I am making that point to ask this question. Why do we have such a negative view of God? In the legal language of the United States and perhaps other Western countries, there is something called an act of God. An act of God is invariably a disaster. If you read a law dictionary, a real estate dictionary, a business dictionary, or any other kind of dictionary that's related, the definition of an act of God is some catastrophic natural event that cannot be anticipated nor reasonably prevented and which interrupts the normal flow of life. And an act of God is an argument that can be used in court to defend, let's say, if DHL or FedEx promises to deliver your parcel by tomorrow at noon and there is an earthquake, you cannot sue FedEx. Well, you can sue, but you wouldn't win. FedEx can argue in court. They attempted to meet the deadline, but they were prevented by an act of God. A hurricane is an act of God. Katrina was an act of God. The earthquake in Haiti, I believe in 210 or 211, was an act of God. The tsunami of 204 was an act of God. The earthquake in Japan was an act of God. An avalanche that takes lives is an act of God. A volcanic eruption is an act of God. A mudslide is an act of God. There are no acts of Satan. It is small wonder that even among Christians, God has such a bad name. Some of us believe that God is responsible for plagues, for disease, for war, for child, for stillbirth, for divorce, for abortions. And yet the Bible says, he that loveth not, knoweth not God. Finish the verse. For God is love. Who is really responsible? As we press on with the subject, innocent and condemned. Let us go to Genesis chapter 2. We shall read verses 16 and 17 of Genesis chapter 2. If you have it, say amen. The Bible says, and the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayst freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. If you look at verse, well, both verses, they tell us very convincingly that Adam and Eve did not own the earth. Why do I say that? If they had owned the earth, God would have no authority to tell them what to eat and what not to eat. Are you with me? Because the world still belonged to God, but under their limited supervision, God can exercise his higher authority and say, of every tree of the garden thou mayst freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. In the day you eat, says God. In the day you disobey me, you will die. And since the world is under your supervision, what befalls you will befall the world. 
chapter 3, verse 1 of Genesis. The Bible says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, He shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, He shall not eat of it, neither shall he touch it, lest he die. The woman confirmed what God had said. And she added a little piece not found in Genesis, which is, Thou shalt not touch it. She confirmed it. And so many of us, we know what God has said. Are you with me or are you sleeping with your eyes open? So many of us know, most of the world knows the seventh day is the Sabbath. Most of the world keeps Sunday. And so the woman said, yes, God said we should not eat. We know we should avoid meats. We know we should avoid alcohol. We know we should avoid cigarettes. The Bible is against anything that defiles this temple. But it is fashionable to smoke. It is hip to take a drink. It is the in thing to eat dead animals. And so we use reasons that have to do with social custom to disobey God. And so the woman said, yes, God said, we should not eat. Verse 4, and the serpent said unto the woman, he shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Verse 6, and when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and the tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. The eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. How did they know they were naked? Sin. Read verse 25 of chapter 2 of the book of Genesis. The Bible says, and they were both naked, the man and his wife. Finish the verse, and were not ashamed. Now in verse 25 of Genesis 2, there is no shame associated with nakedness. They weren't even aware that they were naked. They were covered with light. In verse 7 of chapter 3, there is shame. What made the difference? What brought the shame? Sin. In verse 8, the Bible says, And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. What led them to run from God? What's the answer? Sin. Who sinned? Mankind. Not God. When you run from God, you run from every blessing God has. Now, can the devil bless you? Yes. What did he tell Christ? All these kingdoms will I give you under glory if you will fall down and worship me. There are things the devil can give you. Okay, let's call them blessings in quotation marks. But a pig is not blessed when he is fattened up because you know what he's fattened up for the kill that's all the devil does when he gives you things he fattens you for the slaughter and so only God can bless Satan sets you up he doesn't bless you why did shame enter the world sin who sinned we did why did disease enter the world? Sin. Who sinned? We sinned. Why did death enter the world? Sin. Who sinned? We sinned. Our subject is innocent and condemned. God is an innocent God. Now our theme is God has answers. But the only way to arrive at answers, whether you're in a schoolroom or you're doing research in a lab, is to be honest. 
If you do not bring honesty to your search for truth, you will be led into error. We must be honest. And the honest truth is, and no truth is dishonest, all the problems of the world today are the fault of humanity, not God. Not one. Now, I speak with all due respect. When a child is born dead, you can't blame God. Because God told Adam, in the day thou eatest thereof, death. In James chapter 1, reading from verse 13, go there with me. As we continue with the subject, innocent and condemned. James 1, reading from verse 13. The Bible says, let no man say when he's tempted... I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lusts, and what? Enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth what? And sin bringeth forth what? Death. God is innocent. We are guilty. When Daniel prayed that mighty prayer in Daniel chapter 9, verse 7, he said, O Lord, righteousness belongeth unto thee, but unto us confusion of faces. If you want your relationship to God, with God to improve or to begin, there must be an admission of guilt. There must be an admission of wrong. There must be an admission that God is righteous. God is just. God is innocent of any wrongdoing in anyone's life. And from time to time when I'm asked to speak publicly, I take a few minutes to say publicly that in all my life, every problem I have had, insofar as I can honestly assess, I have brought on myself. Every blessing has come from God. And so from time to time, I like to say, God has never, never done me anything wrong. But I have made a career of doing everything wrong to God. And I'm alive in this pulpit because of his mercy. God is innocent. David prayed in Psalm 51, 4, Against thee, thee only have I sinned, and done this evil in thy sight, that thou might be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou judgest. We're told in Psalm 145, verse 17, The Lord is righteous in all his ways, and holy in all his works. We are responsible for the calamities in this world. Every single one of them. Not Satan. Let me introduce something to your thinking. The Bible says, For as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Romans chapter 5, verse 12. That one man is whom? Adam. And Adam committed one sin. That is recorded. One. That tells us a few things. Most of which I will not go into tonight. But I will mention this one and then another. That is the earliest argument in the Bible, I would imagine, for God's demand of us, from us, of perfection. Many Seventh-day Adventists do not believe it's possible to live above sin. If God did not believe in perfection, he could not have condemned Adam for committing one sin. Are you not listening? You're sleeping again with your eyes open. <laughs> did you hear me? The closest you can get to perfection and not actually be there is to have one flaw. Adam made 
one mistake, and God evicted him from the garden. Why? Because God has zero tolerance for sin. But here's the point I wanted to introduce to your minds. If no other sins had been committed from then until now, Christ would still have to come. Uh, you missed it. I know you did. Were you thinking? Let me say it again. All that was required for Jesus Christ to come and die was for one sin to be committed, just one. Now, why am I making that point? To make this, all the sins that followed Adam's one sin were unnecessary. Now, I'm not saying Adam's sin was necessary, no. But I want to stress all that happened after Adam sinned. All the sins that occurred after Adam's one sin were all unnecessary. Now, if that's the case, and it is, the condition of the world today is similarly unnecessary. Because if we had learned, and I say we as a species, if Adam and Eve had learned from their mistake, as they ought to have, and if their children had learned and followed and had kept themselves from sin by the power of God, the world would still be as close as possible to the way it was before Adam sinned. Are you following me? All the sin that followed Adam's sin were not necessary. Too many of us believe that sin is necessary from time to time. It is never necessary. And if humanity as a species, as a race, had avoided sin after the sin of our father, we would not have the disease we have. We would not have all the plagues we have. Yes, we would have death. But not all these diseases. There is not one case of sickness in the Bible prior to the flood. Not one case, as Ella White writes about it, not one case of a stillbirth. Because as sinful as they were, those people were still powerful. Because the, the, the benefits of having eaten from the tree of life that Adam passed on to them still affected them. Let me say it again. On two counts, we are responsible for the condition of the world. Count number one, humanity sinned. Count number two, we continued sinning. So when Adam sinned, God said in Genesis chapter 3, verse 17, And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake. That's the first curse. In chapter 4, there was a murder. Cain killed Abel. God cursed the earth again. In chapter 7, the flood came. God cursed the earth again. Each time God cursed the earth, it was not God's fault. When God made Adam, Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, the Bible says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Here was breath, and here was dust. We are dust, we're not breath. And so when Adam sinned, Genesis chapter 3, verse 17, as we read, And the Lord God said unto Adam, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, curse is the ground. Now the Bible says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. But when God came to curse, he cursed the ground, not the breath. You understand? Because the breath is from where? Above. Mm-hmm. Cursed the breath, not the, not the dirt. He cursed the dirt, sorry, not the breath. I say this to add fuel to the fire of my argument. We are responsible for the problems in the world. Because it is we who sinned, not God. But God in his mercy extends to us the hand of salvation. The remarkable thing about God, or one of the remarkable things about God, 
which is completely opposite to the way we function, even though God is innocent, he was, is, and always will be. When the catastrophe called sin occurred, it was God who moved towards us to save us from our sin. Now, we moved from God. Genesis 3, 8, and they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves. We moved from God. Genesis 3, verse 9, and the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? So while we were running from God, God was running to us. And so Jesus said to Zacchaeus in uh, Luke 19, verse 10, the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. What was lost? Sinlessness. What was lost? Immortality. What was lost? Fellowship with the animal kingdom, and now lions eat people, snakes kill people, crocodiles eat people, mosquitoes kill people. What was lost? Oneness between man and wife. What was lost? The union that should have existed between parents and children had the children been born to Adam and Eve before sin. What was lost? Face-to-face -face communication with God. What was lost? Fellowship with holy angels. And who is to blame? We are. But who gets the condemnation? God does. Someone ought to defend God. Why am I beginning God has answers with such a harsh message? Because all the answers God has for us are based on obedience to his word. About how many of you in this building? 75 to 100? About three of you said amen. It's probably because the mic isn't working. You didn't hear me. Let me say it again. Whatever answer God has for you and for me is based on obedience to his word. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 49, paragraph 2, Ella White writes, Obedience, perfect and perpetual, was the condition of eternal happiness. On this condition, they were to have access to the tree of life. Shall I say it again? Obedience, perfect and perpetual. What is perfect obedience? How often? All the time. What is perpetual obedience? Same thing, all the time. Obedience, perfect and perpetual, was the condition of eternal happiness. What is a condition? Something that is required for something else to happen. Did you get what I just said? Listen to 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. You know it. Say it with me. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just. But what has to happen first? We must confess. That's a condition. A condition is something that must precede something else. And that is required for the something else to happen. Obedience. Perfect and perpetual was the condition of eternal happiness. On this condition, they were to have access to the tree of life. Now, why were Adam and Eve driven from the tree of life? Give me one word. Disobedience. They disobeyed whom? The creator. Who was that? Christ. Now, why do I specify Christ. Everything God does for us, he does through Christ. There is nothing God will ever do for you or for me that he does outside of Christ. Let me be specific. The only reason why you and I are alive today is because of Christ, his sacrifice. 
And his sacrifice includes his sinless life, the hard life he lived, his voluntary death, and his tremendous victory over death by raising himself. And I repeat, raising himself. But at the Father's request and command. On the basis of that, God can do whatever he wants to do for you. And so, obedience to Christ was the condition of eternal happiness. Every answer God has for your problems and mine proceed from obedience to his word. Innocent and condemned. Let me tell you from my heart. If you want to see your life change or get better, Review your relationship with Christ and try to identify areas of disobedience. And by his unfailing grace, try to obey. Watch your life change. Every answer God has for us is based on obedience to his word. If Adam had obeyed God, you and I, would not be in this condition. You do not need to graduate from the theological seminary. You don't need a PhD in the Bible. You simply need to be honest and look at what the Bible says. Now let's connect Genesis to Revelation, which spanned 1,500 years as far as the writers are concerned, but 6,000 as far as Earth's history is concerned. Genesis, Adam was put out because of disobedience. Revelation, blessed are they that do his commandments that they may have what? Right. On what basis do we return to the tree of life? Obedience. Not legalism, obedience. Let me make a call, an appeal, simply. If there's some area in your life where you know, no guesswork, you know, you're not obedient. And you want to surrender that area of rebellion to God tonight and say, Father, help me to obey you in this area where I have historically defied you. But in your mercy, you've kept me alive. Help me, Father, to obey you in that area of disobedience, rebellion, and transgression. If you know there is an area of conscious, knowing, deliberate, intentional, willful disobedience, and you will say, Father, I want to obey you. Help me. If that's your experience and that's your desire, without looking around to see who is responding, may I see your right hand if it appeals to you or applies to you. Stand up with me, those of you who raised your hands. We want God to answer our questions. Every answer God gives you and me will come from his word. Because Christ is the word. He is the Alpha and the Omega. Anything God says to you and me, it comes through Christ. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Our loving Father in heaven, we thank you, dear God, for your mercy. Your mercy is so elastic, Father. We simply cannot understand how over 6,000 years you're still persevering with us. Doing all you can to save as many who will accept your salvation in Christ. Father, if in our personal lives we have blamed you for the catastrophes of this world, for sin, plague, war, famine, disease, death, divorce, whatever the calamities may be. If we at any time have condemned you and blamed you, we ask you to forgive us for wrongfully accusing you. Father, you are an innocent God, a God of love. We are at fault. We acknowledge that tonight. And we ask you to forgive us, Father, for charging you falsely. And we pray, Father, that you would continue to extend your mercy to us. Not simply forgive us, dear God, but give us the mind, give us the heart to live by your word, to live by your wisdom, 
to obey you from the heart. Thank you for preserving, persevering with us. Thank you for Christ. Thank you for the convicting work of the Holy Spirit. And for the angels that excel in strength that keep us from a thousand accidents. All for the sake of bringing us to the place of surrender. That we might be saved. We are so grateful, dear God, that you're not willing that any should perish. That includes us. So forgive us, Father, for our disobedience. We have stood to say we surrender that area of defiance and rebellion to you. And we pray for the obedient mind of Christ. Because obedience is life. Disobedience is death. So let us leave this building there, God, with a renewed desire to walk in your will by your grace. Bring us back tomorrow morning, we pray. In Jesus' name, let all God's people say, Amen and Amen. You may be seated.